Hello and welcome to India Market Open. We are gearing you up for trade this morning and it's expected to be a range band session, Neeraj. Uh, not too much happening. Global queues also largely muted. Of course, you've had that big accident at the port of Baltimore. But apart from that, I think uh, everything is looking largely stable and on the sidelines. Yeah, something that you spoke about yesterday as well and just yeah. turning out to be that way now. Let's see if our expiry brings about some uh, fun and games. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, yeah, you are absolutely right. But interesting days. Yeah. Truncated it's, week, it's, so on and so forth. Yeah, so volumes generally are actually quite light uh, across global equity markets. Asian markets is that what we'll start with. But just before I jump into that, a quick check on how implied Nifty is looking. It's expected to be a flat start to the day, so don't expect fireworks. A 50-point downtick is what's expected in trade. So today's uh, implied Nifty looks very similar to what we saw in yesterday's implied nifty as well range bound trade is what we're expecting in the session like i said asian markets are trading flat to slightly higher it was wall street that continued to see profit taking for the second straight day this comes in after those markets made a record high last week uh, markets remember have pulled back just a little bit volumes are also quite light uh, given that it is a holiday truncated week uh, for wall street as well uh, traders will monitor commentary coming in from the Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller on later today. Uh, so that's, of course, uh, Wednesday evening for Wall Street as well. Markets will be reacting, or we will, of course, uh, take a check of that only in tomorrow's day of trade. In stock-specific action, Boeing, we believe, is at, a, is at a risk of a Moody's downgrade on cash flow concerns. Tesla had a pretty sharp rally, moved up 3%, still trading uh, much, much lower uh, year to date, but yesterday's trade saw the stock gain 3%, largely on back of a launch uh, of a full self driving technology in the US. So, a free one month trial for existing customers in the US is what it's unveiled. Apart from that, um, not market moving for us, but interesting that Trump Media and Technology Group uh, jumped 16.1% on its listing day yesterday. Apart from you that, know, th sorry, just that one interesting thing that I was reading a story that. Uh, as per, uh, as per some math, hmm. Trump media at a point of time was the most expensive U.S. stock to bet against. There was no other stock in that space, in space. which was that expensive as Trump media. So pretty interesting what it did because it, I think it went up to some 77 dollars. And then ended yeah, at about 57. Yeah. So fairly choppy day for that one. And on a day with the market, uh, momentum was fairly subdued. So yeah, yeah I guess Trump uh, is trumping on the exchanges as well. Uh, but apart from that, remember, you've got a whole bunch of data that the markets will be eyeing in. Keeping that in mind, you're seeing traders on the sidelines. So just to take you through everything that's lined up for the week, you've got uh, jobless claims, GDP and consumer sentiment for the U.S. that comes out on Thursday. Inflation data on Friday, and Friday is the big day. Remember, it is Good Friday holiday, but the markets will very closely watch out for what that inflation reading shows up. Some big uh, sell-side brokerages have indicated that if by any chance there's any indication of an uptick in inflation, an indication by the Fed that there could be a rate hike, a rate pause, that could spell death for global equity markets. So very closely watching out for that inflation data that will come out of the U.S. Apart from that, I don't know, Neeraj, whether this is of any interest to you, but we've been talking about the Bitcoin, and after a launch of those ETFs in Wall Street, I believe the London Stock Exchange will be launching Bitcoin uh, ETN on the 28th of May. So, uh, of course, Bitcoin continues to trade strong. It trades above $70,000 a barrel, uh, $70,000. But very interesting fact that I came across, the current market cap of Bitcoin is higher than the GDP of 159 of the world's economies of 2023. So that's an asset class that was shunned and now larger than most uh, 160 economies. Yeah, uh, but quite stunning really. And, and the use cases that Bitcoin and crypto is turning out to be always had and now getting reinforced. Pretty interesting as to what's happening. And cannot be ruled there. out that we might even see it, uh, you know, become a mainstream? reality uh, in mainstream asset classes. Who's to tell? But for now, a launch in the London Stock Exchange is what we're expecting. Crude, on the other hand, trades flat. Remember the Russia-Ukraine stress, no, pol no, no cuts uh, from OPEC uh, or increase in production from the OPEC plus meeting is expected. But a slightly muted dollar is what's giving, uh, keeping crude okay as well. Gold, on the other hand, continues to move up, uh, safe haven buying, some may call it. Uh, fears of a global recession still not completely ruled out. So that's what the world looks like, Neeraj. But I think back home, uh, a little bit like yesterday, 
Uh, today also maybe range bound, mid cap did see some euphoria in trade yesterday. A whole bunch of QIP, so stock specific <laughs> trade will pretty much uh, dominate today's action as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're going to talk about all of those. There are three or four and one where QIP prices have been firmed up as well. But the trade setup firstly, when I look at the put data and typically follow what options do as opposed to what charts could indicate um, universal, right, options. So the put data shows 22,000 having the most OI and therefore you could argue that that could be the key support level uh, from, a, from a very, very short term two day perspective if you will. Look at that put option data and, and 22,000 has this highest OI and which is the very interesting support. 20 to 500 far end, I mean really, it's got to do a lot with writing options in order to make sure that you take the trade home or take the money home. But from a support perspective, 22,000 on the put side seems to be the key thing. Samina was mentioning the mid cap index. Now the anomaly yesterday was though, that while the mid cap index did very well for itself, but the market breadth wobbled yesterday. We didn't have a very good market breadth. So again, I don't know if it's a March end or what have you, but look at that. On a day when the mid cap index was firmly in the green, you had an advanced decline ratio which was two is to one in favor of the declines. That was the key point I thought in trade yesterday, and a very interesting one at that. So um, let's see if mid caps continue to grind lower despite the fact that the index at, at an own level might be doing okay for itself. The one thing though that is coming out very interestingly, and yesterday I was talking to some dealing rooms, and today morning I saw a Nomura note which said that their road shows across I think the Asia Pacific region seems to suggest that PSU banks are starting to see demand. Never did we ever hear mm. foreign clients okay. getting constructive on PSU banks. Now that is something that Nomura is saying is happening. So that to my mind was very, very interesting. And Samina, I, um, you travel a lot so maybe you would have an insight here. <laughs> but yesterday I was being told that uh, the wedding season in full gusto is leading to packed banquet halls. Yeah in hotels. So the FNB side of the business, is not just the room revenue, yeah. but FNB could actually be very strong in in this quarter maybe, but yeah. certainly April, May, June. I think I agree because a lot of those banquet sales have gone up, corporate bookings as well for yes. banquets. So of course with travel returning back, uh, a whole bunch of off-sites, uh, corporate huddles also seem to be seeing helping them. But you know Neeraj, you were talking about option data and I want to bring up uh, what we saw in terms of June bets. Hmm. Now this is betting on the big election. Uh, and in terms of option activity, we are seeing 21,000 and 24,000 strike, seeing aggressive amount of activity. Mm -hmm. Very obviously indicating mm -hmm. that the traders are betting on a 3,000 point uh, volatility in that range. So between 21,000 on the downside, 24,000 on the upside is pretty much uh, where the markets are betting on for the general elections. We've also seen an above normal jump in open interest in the June contract. So these really are early signs of positions. And of course, uh, what was uh, what caught attention was a lot of money is at play, expecting that there could be a big move up to 24,000. So what we saw is that uh, shorting of options are much higher than call options, indicating a very positive, a clear positive bias, at least for now, in terms of an election outcome. So markets or traders not pricing in too much of a negative outcome for general elections. Apart from that, the April series, which is the next month's contracts, have also seen in the money put option of 24,000 strike, uh, indicating that large money is expecting a sharp rally over the next 30 days. Neeraj, this, these numbers, um, uh, uh, while they look great and indicate what the market sentiment is or what the big money is really thinking, it also leaves you very little room for error because God forbid there is an outcome that's not in line with expectation. If all the bets are on a betting on a positive bias, I am not sure how the market reaction would play. Of course, 21,000 is seeming like a base, but nevertheless. Yeah, I mean, that, so the black swan of sorts, who can budget for yeah. that? Difficult to say that, but uh, for now, uh, policy continuity being bet upon and, 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 and let's see how that shapes up. Uh, the, just the very other interesting aspect is, uh, and before we get to stocks, and uh, Samina, just the quantum of QIPs, block deals, pulp deals getting launched. We have about three or four that we are talking about today. But 2024, FI20, FI24 has been a year of promoter exits, PE exits, not promoter exit really, promoter stakes coming off, PE exits, uh, most importantly and MNCs shunning a very large portion. So I think in some sense on 31st March or maybe tomorrow when we kind of show 
what's happening uh, on, on that front, it'll be very interesting data. Yeah, and that def definitely is one big reason why the wealth industry in this country is doing exceptionally well. And even tax collection, because of course, as promoters check out, you do land up uh, signing big tax bills as well on back of those cash outs. But like Neeraj said, the mo yesterday's morning was about brokerages that were uh, helping counters in trade. Today, the story is QIPs. A uh, couple of big ones, actually. I'll start with CDSL, because this is something that uh, hit the street uh, post-market close yesterday. Standard Chartered Bank, uh, which owns stake in CDSL uh, of about 7.18%, is looking to offload its complete holding in CDSL. JP Morgan is going to be leading this block deal. The deal size is valued at $151 million at a floor price of up to 7.5 million equity shares. Uh, remember, the floor price comes in 1,672 rupees, which is about uh, a 6.5% discount to yesterday's close. So again, significant stancy marks its exit. Remember, uh, like Neeraj also indicated, with the euphoria that we've seen and the kind of price increases, valuations going up for a whole bunch of these companies over the last few years, it's only obvious that some of these uh, institutions or investors would take some profits off the table. Uh, similar for Aster DM as well, it's private equity player Olympus Capital, uh, which is taking off, uh, taking some stake off the table from Aster DM as well. They are looking to sell close to 10% of the holding in the company. Aster DM holds 18.96, uh, sorry, Olympus holds 18.96 in Aster DM. So not a complete exit, but a major chunk uh, being exited from Aster DM. Uh, this, is, this deal is priced at $235 million. Floor price is about 400 rupees a share, which is again at a 9% discount to yesterday's close. Remember, the stock has been an outperformer. Over the last one year, it's up 146%. In the last few months, it's up about 35%. Uh, and Aster Deem has been very clear that they're constantly looking for partners, looking to aggressively grow the India business. Last year, of course, they had a major sort of inflow coming in from a GCC partner as well. So uh, they never ruled this out. Now, of course, it's becoming a reality. Interesting to see who picks up that stake in Aster Deem. Uh, well, uh, Angel One is the other one. Again, Angel One has also gone on record to say that they are looking at expansion plans, they are looking to venture into uh, beyond equity and mutual funds, into credit and fixed income products, go into smaller tiers where there's under representation of Angel One. And to back that up, they're launching a QIP at a floor price of 2,555, once again at a 7% discount to yesterday's close. So uh, Neeraj, more or less an expect line, something to work hard as well, quarter retention, we've talked about this. Uh, we've got details of that deal too. Yeah, I mean, 517, a bit of a discount to that mm. floor price of 544. But let's wait and watch how this one shapes up. So that's, you know, the sum and substance viewers of the key stocks that will definitely react because of the QIPs yeah. or the block. But you know, Neeraj, if there is the demand is robust. We saw that with Walkhart as well, right? They're, I'm not sure why these uh, QIPs are coming in and stake sales are coming in the kind of discount that they are because liquidity is still ripe, you'd imagine. I mean, a 7% discount, a 10% discount. These are big discounts, right? Yeah, I mean, but hopefully that's, I mean, just the floor price and maybe the demand comes in higher. But I, I, at Unlikely. Least, for work hard, we didn't see that either, Yeah, work right? hard, we didn't see. But for, for one of the others, I think, uh, for, from what ITC. banking sources were saying, that, uh, that they want to come in at a QIP, or they wanted to come in at a QIP, which was, uh, I mean, the promoter entity obviously wanting a slightly higher price, the yeah. bankers wanting a slightly lower price. It's got settled somewhere in between. So the floor price was merely an indication of what the worst can happen. But let's see, Wokhart is yeah. a case in point wherein the issue price, what is a discount to the floor price as well. So let's wait and watch. Uh, and I think we've also seen that for your mama earths, where the, where the peas were exiting, but the floor price was what was respected. It wasn't on the upper band yeah. of the price yeah, band. Most certainly. So that that's one. So the QIPs is one block. And then there are research notes. Uh, mm -hmm. In between, there is Sanofi India. So I just want yeah. to mention that one. It's announced an exclusive distribution partnership with CIPLA to expand the reach of the CNS portfolio in India. This should be a positive piece of development for Sanofi. So therefore, watch out for this one. And then brokerage notes. Uh, there is uh, there are a clutch of them, actually. I'm highlighting two, and then we'll highlight more as well. Uh, but Goldman on Reliance, and because it's Reliance, and because yesterday, if you see the contributors, Reliance, HDFC, etc. took the index lower. Goldman has a buy call, but they've raised the target price to 3,400. They are saying that consolidated returns are at an inflection point in FY24. Uh, they estimate that the cash return on cash invested 
will expand by 270 basis points. Effectively, cash flow will improve for Reliance Industries. They expect, of course, CapEx to fall sequentially, and that's the other aspect, that the money that's getting generated will not be used in CapEx because it might be coming to the end of the CapEx cycle. So the CapEx will fall sequentially. And Goldman expects, now this is the, you know, maybe the tricky part, they expect 17% EBITDA CAGR over FY24 to 27. The Bloomberg consensus estimate is about 6 to 10%, or rather slightly lower than that, and Goldman is way above those consensus estimates. So that's the key thing, that their estimates are aggressive when it comes to Reliance Industries. Let's wait and watch. But if Reliance reacts today, you know why it is reacting. It's on account. One of the reasons could be on account of the Goldman note. Very constructive. What is also very interesting, and maybe an even more eye-popping uh, eye note, is UBS on ABB. And why do I say that? Because ABB is not a cheap stock. Uh, it's trading at about 75 times, 76 times, uh, 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 one year forward earnings, uh, but UBS has come out with a buy call and they've raised the target price to 7,550 versus 5,380 earlier, so substantial uptick in target price. Why they have done this? They're saying that electrification in motion will drive growth and margins, and they believe that ABB is the best play on infrastructure scale-up in voltage electrification. They expect improvement, I mean, they expect scope to ramp up in the voltage electrification portfolio, of course, but they expect improvement in margins, which should support premium valuation. Now, here, the, the and I, there are more notes, and we'll come to that, but Samina, just one quick thing out here. I was talking to um, Naveen Chandramohan of ITIS Capital yesterday, and we were talking about valuations, <laughs> and ABB at 75 times seems expensive. ABB, the last 10-year history, um, when it traded its worst multiples, except for COVID, of course, yeah. the, the multiples were 65 times. So it's never been a cheap, cheap stock, and now it is showing signs of growth. So the bulls are arguing that is 75 expensive, yes, but in the context of yeah. what it has and the context of the earnings growth that it can deliver, maybe the market will give it the multiple that it is giving. It's a fair representation of our markets as whole. Maybe. I mean, that's a little bit of like in the India story, right? Yeah, but it just, I mean, Seems my argument is just so expensive that how can you come out and, you know, raise Justify targets? Justify it and say that it's all relative. But, but in other space, I think, Neeraj, we talked about this yesterday, and this is biscuit and um, biscuit manufacturers. So FMCG uh, doesn't seem to be getting a breather at all. Cocoa prices are trading at record highs, and they're expected to continue to move up. Of course, a lot of the uh, consumer, a lot of the companies that have cocoa as a raw material, have been hedging their allocation. But nevertheless, uh, there could be an impact. So, stocks like Britannia, Patanjali, ITC, and Nestle. You want to keep this on your radar. There could be a downside or downward bias to them on back of higher raw material prices, which is cocoa. Needed. We talked about this yesterday, but I think uh, uh, as this news catches up, there could be a little bit of a stock reaction even today and tomorrow over the course of the next couple of days. And it's not just cocoa, right? You've also got palm oil that's higher. You've got crude that trades higher. Wheat. Agri products like maize uh, trading high. So 15 to 20 percent uh, impact on gross margins is what most analysts believe this could have. Yeah, and, and, you, know, and you know, wheat on account of uh, what's happening, Russia, Ukraine, etc. Yeah. But cocoa has got some serious structural disruptions that have happened in Ghana and Africa, some of the other places. Yeah. And as a result of which, it will be very interesting to see if the chocolates that you and I consume, or at least I consume, <laughs> I don't know about you, maybe they become a bit more expensive. So it will be very interesting so to see that. So all that gain that we were hoping that El Nino, uh, which was, you know, abating, would be replaced by El Nina, La La is Nina, going to yeah. have is going to be replaced by, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how these dynamics work, but for now, we will try and delve into this over the course of the next few days, but for yeah. now, it's back to Editor's Cut. Yeah, but just before Editor's Cut, just two other stocks that people should keep in mind. So, yeah, the newspaper reports about uh, the Kalyani family feud um, deepening and, and, and the nephew and nieces of Baba Kalyani uh, trying to take some action against the holdings and, and, you know, gets their share or what have you. So just keep an eye out for Bharat Forge in case there is a reaction, so that could be one. Madhusan has enhanced capacity to meet aerospace sector demand, so watch out for Samvardhana Madhusan. That could be the other one. So two auto component stocks or in that space per se, but both of them different news flow for themselves, so watch out for that one as well. 
And uh, lastly, in UFLEX, the director of the UK unit, um, and there is some news flow coming around that, which is not necessarily the most positive. So maybe UFLEX has some reactions. So that two or three names that uh, also could be interesting.